Okay, so <clears throat> we've been dealing with the PV phase diagram, you know, for the most part of the course and, and also for all of the gas work. So all of that was pressure on the vertical axis, volume on the uh, X axis and temperature really wasn't shown. So it was kind of difficult to follow what temperature was doing. We just had isotherms drawn on there um, and adiabats, but today we'll, we'll shift gears and go 90 degrees. We'll keep pressure on the Y axis, but then we'll start looking at how it changes with temperature. So just, just so you, just to summarize, we've been looking at PV phase diagrams and now we're gonna switch to PT phase diagram. So pressure, temperature, and then we'll introduce the 3D phase diagram surface. So let's uh, go through the PV phase diagram just to review what happens with these three different lines and to, to emphasize what's going on with, uh, with boiling and with freezing or melting and, you know, uh, yeah. So condensation and freezing or, or melting and boiling. And so we have these different paths here. And this is one thing that you should be able to do given any kind of phase diagram is narrate these paths. Okay. N not that I'm gonna have the time to grade long, you know, essays, but if you can't narrate these paths, you can't answer questions about the phase diagrams. And so. Let's just go ahead quickly and go through some of these. Let's start here in this solid for path A. And look how small the volume is over here. So we're right here, um, path A, beginning in the solid. So this piston is pushed all the way down. So I'm just gonna draw like a part of the piston and the solid is all right here and it's all solid. So this piston, you see what I'm saying? What the piston is all the way down here and, and it's pushed down so there's no liquid phase, there's certainly no gas phase. So the only thing inside our piston chamber at that small a volume is solid. So we start to relieve, uh, well, we start to, to pull um, some volume on that, you know, open up the volume. And, uh, and the pressure would drop, but we're cranking the temperature up a little bit. We just can't see the temperature effect here. So to keep the pressure from dropping, we're putting in some temperature. So we're going to keep that same pressure line all the way across. So we increase the volume. Pressure would drop if it was an isotherm, but it's not. We're putting in a little temperature to keep that pressure. So we're going across this isobar. We get to this point. We've put in enough temperature where we start to melt it. And so this right here is the melting. This whole region here is melting, but we're on this isobar. So this is just melting uh, at that particular pressure. So solid and liquid equilibrium, that's melting. Or, or freezing. If we're going to the right, we're melting. If we're going to the left, we're freezing. So that's, you know, we've moved that piston out a little bit and now we have some liquid, okay, in the solid, in equilibrium. We push, push it out a little further, pull it out a little further and then we're in this liquid region. We've added more temperature to keep the pressure the same. And so when we get up, say, to this, this volume, then um, there's liquid only. Then we, again, raise the piston a little bit more, uh, create some more volume, and then we've added a little temperature to keep the pressure the same, and now we start to see it boiling. So it's starting to produce some bubbles in the liquid. And so we get out here, we have a meniscus. But notice inside our volume, it's mostly liquid because we're way over here on this region. So at this point, it's mostly liquid, a little bit of gas. We keep increasing the volume. Now we're up, up, up here, say, where the liquid meniscus is, is pretty low. Like, in fact, the liquid meniscus will drop, like it might be here, and then the rest is gas. And then we keep going until we've run out of liquid. So the last little drop of liquid at the bottom uh, evaporates and we're in the fully gas range. So I'm just, my picture may not be like, I should actually draw little frames, <laughs> you know, at this point, at this point, at this point, but you could just kind of see as we raise that, that piston, we have all solid, then we have solid liquid, and then we have all liquid, and then we have liquid gas, and then we have all gas as we increase the volume. And the only reason, only way we were able to keep it out of an isobar is the adding temperature. So that's why it's melting. That's why it's boiling at those particular regions. 
So that would be path A. Okay. Let's do path B. So here we start out in the solid. Again, the piston's pushed all the way in, solid only. And down here, we're at, at such a low pressure that the, the liquid just doesn't exist below this pressure. Okay. And so we go straight from solid to gas. So we get up, we get up, uh, say, to this height, and it's gas, and our solid has shrunk down. It's even really smaller, you know. And eventually we get up here to gas only. So in this region, it's solid and gas, and that's the sublimation region. I'll go ahead and put in this region boiling. Just sort of assuming that we're increasing volumes in all these cases and increasing temperature in all these cases. So, okay. Now, <clears throat> what if we have a fixed volume? Well, then we don't have a piston, right? So we've got a lid that's bolted on. <laughs> right, we've got our little bolts here. Hold it on. Now we've got a fixed volume when we increase the temperature. And so we could be in the sublimation region. We could increase the temperature, but we've got a closed container. And so if you've got a vertical line here, that's a closed container because it's a fixed volume. So we're in a closed container. We start raising the temperature. At the triple point, we have all three phases in equilibrium. And so we would have a little solid here that's a solid. We'd have some liquid. And we'd have some gas. Um, oh, I don't need a line there. And that would be at the triple point. Or in this case, it's a triple line. So if we're over here, this would be, um, you know, this much gas so so these would be balanced as like three weights on a on a plank and this much liquid and this much solid so we'd have this is farthest away from from the fulcrum so you could think about this as a seesaw with three people on it <clears throat> you have a little bit of solid a little bit more liquid and a lot of gas at this volume if we were way over here like if the fulcrum was right here if that's our volume we'd have quite a bit of liquid um, you know, a little less solid and not, and not very much gas at all. <clears throat> so these, these balancing points, like if we were down here at this pressure, we'd have a seesaw with just two, two masses on it. And so you remember seesaws from when you were a kid? Did y'all ever have seesaws? Like they kind of banned them from most, you know, parks because I don't know, they're dangerous. And so like if, if, if you're uh, like like where this crosses this green line, where it's sitting right there, if that's the fulcrum, okay, that's a really tough seesaw, isn't it? So it's a seesaw that looks like this. And so, you, so you've got a, you got a skinny kid here, okay, and you got a chunky kid here, <laughs> right? So it balances, right? So, and sometimes you had to do that. If you wanted a seesaw with a little kid, like you had to cheat up, like you get up in the plank and the little kid on the other end and you can still seesaw with the little kid, right? But uh, like younger, younger cousin or something like that. And so what does this tell us? Well, this distance here um, is L1, let's say L1. This distance is L2. And this, you could do mass, you could do number of moles. Let's do number of moles. Okay, N1 and N2. And those are equal. So if it's a short distance, it's a big number of moles. And if it's a long distance, it's a small number of moles. And that's called the lever rule. Okay. And so any of these equilibrium regions in a PV phase diagram, we have to use the lever rule to figure out what the relative proportions are of, like in this case, the gas and the liquid. Okay. Since there's a break right here, there is no solid. So it's, it's between where this, it's this mark right here at that pressure and this mark right here at that pressure. Add together to give us this volume. So the amount of gas volume here is large, the amount of liquid volume is small, and you would use the lever rule to figure out what the relative proportions are. Okay. Now if we go up past this point, 
then we're in the gaseous region and it's all gas. So you put enough heat into it, you lose the solid, then you have equilibrium with liquid and gas, and then you lose all of the liquid and you're in the gaseous region. Okay. And this is in the gaseous region, this is the critical point. So it diverges from the liquid gas equilibrium region over here, not at the critical point. So it's not going to move left. If you're in a fixed volume, you've picked your vertical line, you can't leave it, okay? Because that's the container's volume. So whatever the container's volume is, that's your vertical line. And then you look at the phase diagram and you could calculate how many moles are in the gas, how many moles are in the liquid and everything in that container. So that's pretty cool that you could just use this phase diagram to calculate the partitioning of all of the different gas, solid, liquid, and gas in a container. Okay. Now let's take this diagram and rotate it to where we can see the temperature axis. Okay, so here's the, the PT phase diagram. This one, I don't know, is, does this look familiar? It should from freshman chemistry. We've shown this one. I don't remember showing the PV one in, in freshman chemistry. So this one, you should see that, oh yeah, that's what a phase diagram looks like. Um, you have pressure on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis. And for most of our solid, our, our substances, uh, we deal with things that are solid, liquid, and gas around one atmosphere. So here's one atmosphere. And so where that crosses this solid liquid equilibrium line, that's the normal melting point. Okay. And where it crosses the gaseous line, that's the normal boiling point. When I say where it crosses, I mean the temperature where it crosses. And so you see those temperatures here, Tm, so I would say uh, put Tm here, and Tb. So you just pick that pressure, one atmosphere, you come across and you say, okay, at one atmosphere, this is where this substance would melt, this is where this substance would boil. And then here's the triple point. That's where that substance, all three phases are in equilibrium. So at that point, that's the only point where you can have all three phases in equilibrium with each other. Here you have only two phases in equilibrium along this line, solid liquid. And then this is the, the liquid gas equilibrium line. And down here is the sublimation, solid straight to gas. So you can do those same paths that we did before. A, you know, we, we started in the solid, we increased the temperature and the volume and we got to this point where it was melting and we paused there at that temperature until all of the solid was gone. And that was that solid liquid equilibrium. And then we're now we're in the fully in the liquid region, increasing the temperature, increasing the volume, keeping the pressure the same, then we boil. And we sit there in that temperature pause until all of the liquid is gone and then we're just heating the gas. And then down here was the B line where we we're all solid and then we had sublimation and we sat at that sublimation temperature until it was all gas. And then C, we worked our way up through that constant volume where we had solid and liquid in equilibrium. Then we reached the, the triple point, continuing to heat it, all of the solid was gone and then we had liquid and gas in equilibrium. So it was boiling and eventually we left that, that space in that volume and kind of diverged into the gaseous region. So this, this is not an accident. It, that's when we left that phase of, of liquid gas equilibrium and we're in the gaseous region. So that was path C in the previous one. So if you're looking at the notes, you could go back and forth between those diagrams and A, B, and C paths are the same on these two. And then if we take a new one here, we start in the, the solid and we cool, we cool it down. No, no, we, um, we, we drop the pressure. So we're sitting at a constant temperature. We drop the pressure, drop the pressure. Um, then at this point, then the solid melts and becomes a liquid. We keep dropping the pressure, dropping the pressure, and then the liquid would boil and we would get a gas. So we're just increasing that volume, uh, dropping the pressure, but keeping the same temperature. Now let's talk about phase diagrams and how they're constructed. This is sort of a side trip, okay? So new topic. Um, there's a thing called the phase rule, okay? And there's degrees of freedom in this 
particular aspect too. Remember most of our degrees of freedom when we talked about them, they were emotional degrees of freedom, like translation, we had three degrees of freedom, moving in X, Y, and Z, and they were independent. So that's what we mean by independent degrees of freedom. I can change X without changing Y and without changing Z. Okay, in the phase diagram, degrees of freedom are the three variables, pressure, temperature, and volume. Can I change those independently? Okay, and if if that's uh, if the answer is yes, <clears throat> then I'm I'm in one of the solid like pure solid or liquid or or gas phases. And since it's a two two dimensional plot, um, single phase regions such as solid, liquid, and vapor have two degrees of freedom. Okay, so I'm sitting in this this region here. Um, I have a single phase and I have two degrees of freedom, meaning I can. In this liquid region, I can change the temperature. Okay, so that's one degree of freedom. I can change the pressure. That's the second degree of freedom. And I'm still in the liquid phase. So I have one phase and I have two degrees of freedom. Now, two phase regions have one degree of freedom. So if you look here on this line right here, so I've got two phases and I've only got one degree of freedom. F is the number of degrees of freedom. Why is that? Well, look what happens here. If I'm here and I want to raise the temperature, I can raise the temperature five degrees. I can choose how many degrees of temperature I can raise it, but I have no choice then how the, how the pressure t uh, changes. Because if I want to keep two phases in equilibrium, that line defines how pressure depends upon temperature. So I've lost a degree of freedom. If I change the temperature, pressure is defined for me because there's a line. Notice in these open regions, there's no lines. And so I can move my point around independently in the T or the P direction. But if I'm on one of these two phase regions, then I'm kind of locked down. If I want to move the temperature and maintain equilibrium, the pressure rises by that equation. And it's the classiest Clapeyron equation for that particular line. Then a triple point, I've lost, I've lost all my degrees of freedom because it's a defined point on this diagram. So I don't have a choice to move temperature or pressure and stay on the triple point because it's a point on this diagram. <clears throat> so this is the phase rule. It's the number of components minus the number of phases plus two. And, and the, I'll just point out in the next slide why we care about this. So this is the number of intensive variables that can be changed independently without disturbing the number of phases in equilibrium. So um, C is the number of components. A pure substance has, a, has a C equal to 1. And then P is the number of phases in, the, in, the fa in equilibrium. So let's look at this. So here's our one component phase diagram. Um, we could have like phase alpha, beta, gamma, etc. And in here, in, the, in any of these open regions, we have two, uh, two degrees of freedom because we have one phase. Uh, on these lines, we have two phases in equilibrium, so we only have one degree of freedom. If I change pressure, then the temperature is defined by the line. If I change temperature, pressure is defined. We have triple points, which is the intersection of three phases. But notice this phase rule tells us that this point is forbidden. And that's the utility of the phase rule. It tells us that if we just have one component in a two-dimensional phase diagram, then uh, we can only have a maximum of three phases in equilibrium. We can't have any kind of quadruple points because there are not enough degrees of freedom for that. So four phases in equilibrium would be forbidden by the phase rule, and that is for one component. If we had multiple components, then we would end up with more degrees of freedom. But for a single component... So what that tells us is if I'm... If I'm doing data and I'm collecting data and I'm, I'm looking at how these uh, lines all converge right here, I know even though it looks like they're all four going to the same spot, that they can't actually go to the same spot. One of these lines is going to diverge. Maybe this one will cut over here and make a triple point. And so then we have a triple point here and this line's gone and a triple point there. So the phase rule tells us how to construct these phase diagrams. That's, that's all. I just feel like I have to talk about the phase rule. It's such an important point of, of thermodynamics for these phase diagrams. 
but you're really not going to use it. We're not going to be constructing phase diagrams in this course, but I need to talk, tell you about the phase rule and how it shows us that certain things are forbidden in these phase diagrams, like a quadruple point for a single component. Okay. So back to uh, phase diagrams and interpreting them. Let's look at an exper some experimental phase diagrams. Here's the experimental phase diagram for water. And it has the normal freezing point, the normal boiling point. Um, and it's kind of a strange phase diagram. I've got this break right here. So this is uh, going up. This is one atmosphere. This is two atmospheres. And then there's this break. And then we go like 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. So it really changes a lot in terms of its y-axis. And so that's why this curve, this curve normally goes up very smoothly, but we've changed the, the rate of change in the y-axis. So, so it looks strange. It diverts over here because um, on a scale where we're changing by thousands, then it would, it would change its slope. Um, so here we have uh, the critical point for water at 647 degrees uh, Kelvin. And then over here, we have all the solid phases. So um, the ice in your refrigerator is ice one. <laughs> How do I know that? Because we're at one atmosphere. Okay. And that's a, what we would call normal ice structure. But if we keep the temperature cold and we really press on it and put it in a piston and just jam down on it, we'll see phase, phase changes even in the solid ice. It'll take a different crystal structure. And so then they discovered ice two and ice three and somewhere in here, I don't know exactly where, um, was what they called ice four. And then they discovered ice five and ice six. And then, then later they discovered that ice four was actually one of the others. And I don't remember which one. And so uh, retracted. But it would really be confusing in the literature to then make ice five, ice four, and make ice six, ice five, because you wouldn't know which phase you're talking about. And you'd have to keep track of what year you were talking about and, and all of these things. And so in order to not introduce that confusion into the literature, they just deleted ice four and kept five, five, and six, six. So that's just, again, to show you that science is a human endeavor. We make mistakes and hopefully correct them later. And then what do you do with the correction? How do you handle it? And so this is how they chose to handle it, to keep ICE-5 and all the data for ICE-5 always consistent throughout time and, and ICE-6 as well, and not change the labels on things. Yeah. I just to be clear, does that go from two atmospheres to 2,000 and 4,000 and 6,000 atmospheres? I yeah, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the, exactly. So let's, so someone get your calculator out and calculate 8,000. So this is 8,000 atmospheres, 14.7 PSI. That seems more like understandable. So take that 8,000 times 14.7. So <laughs> every square inch of that container has 117,000 pounds on it. <laughs> so where is ice five, but in the lab, you know, maybe, you know, you've got a, I don't know, some ice planet out there, you know, Hoth, uh, <laughs> deep in the icy core of Hoth, you have that much pressure from gravity, you know, Pulling all that ice together, you might have ice six in the in the center of Hoth if it really is an ice planet. It looks more like a rocky planet that's cold. But <laughs> if you're not a Star Wars fan, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's pretty. And what's interesting too is look at the slope of this line right here. This liquid uh, solid line. It's it's positive, right? So you could imagine a point where this line would continue at a high enough pressure to where it would it would be a solid above the boiling point of water, which kind of breaks your brain, doesn't it? The normal boiling point of water is at one atmosphere. But if you have ice in, you know, a million atmospheres, you might be able to heat that up above the boiling point of water, but it's still a solid. 
because you have it under so much pressure. And so that's what the value of these phase diagrams are. They tell you what phase you're in at whatever temperature pressure regime you're in. So you could theoretically have ice above the boiling point of water, which is kind of weird, isn't it? This is purely theoretical though, right? No, no, Nobody's no. ever seen this? No, I mean, we have what they call diamond anvil presses. And so you have this really big lever arm of, of steel and, and a hinge and real close to the hinge where you have a lot of mechanical advantage they they put diamond crystals in this thing and since diamond can withstand the pressure it can deliver like a, you know a, like a million atmospheres of pressure and so you put a, a substance in there and then you start turning this screw way out here and it's twisting those arms and putting pressure on it and one of the ways they measure the pressure is they'll put like a ruby crystal in there and the chromium, the the uh, visible spectrum of the chromium atom, you know, atomic spectra have really narrow lines. Remember from PKM1? And, and you start squeezing on those chromium atoms and those lines actually start to shift because you're squeezing on the atoms. <laughs> Particle in a box, right? You put it in a smaller box and the, and the, the energy levels spread apart. And so you can actually measure pressure with the spectroscopy. You know, so you get in there and you look at the shift of those peaks in the visible spectrum and uh, you can tell what pressure you and they have to calibrate it right but they um they calibrate it with this little ruby crystal and then whatever else they put in there then they know the pressure that that other substance is at so this is really high pressure science and so and also diamonds are optically um transparent and so they're this little diamond press anvil is open on either end and so they can send lasers through there and do spectroscopy and characterize the phase diagram that way. So you want to know what the structure of ice six is, you use spectroscopy through these diamond crystals to see what happens. And you can see when it's having a phase transition. So it's really crazy. Solid, solid phase transitions are, are kind of interesting. But here's CO2. Oh, another thing that this shows that this, uh, this negative slope on this solid liquid line, that's what I was saying was unique for water. It's not exact, that's not the only substance that does that, but it's so rare. And that just again means that the solid is less dense than the, the liquid. Okay, the solid exists at lower pressures, the, the liquid exists at higher pressures. That, turn, that changes, uh, slope changes when you get to ice five and ice six, but for ice one, um, you have that negative slope. CO2, notice how CO2 has a positive slope. So the solid's more dense than the liquid. The solid would sink. You put CO2 in liquid CO2, which you'd never really see. Um, but if you did, the solid CO2 would sink. It's more dense. Um, here's, again, the phase diagram tells us what happens in one atmosphere. It sublimes. It goes straight from solid to gas. The publisher kind of missed that little mark there. So <laughs> you see how the little dotted line goes past the mark? So anyway, um, it should actually go down right here. And so then that temperature at, if you were, at, you had dry ice in equilibrium with its gas would be around 194 Kelvin. So really cold. That's why it burns your skin. And, uh, and then the triple point is at five atmospheres and 216 uh, Kelvin at room temperature. So if you were to put dry ice in a container and let it warm up to room temperature. Now, so I don't recommend this. Okay, because you got because you have sixty seven atmospheres in a container now. <laughs> okay, so at room temperature would be sixty seven atmospheres. Again, multiply that by fourteen point seven, and we'll see what that is. If somebody wants to do that for fun, and then here's the CO the supercritical. You know, three hundred four is the critical point, seventy two atmospheres. So you get that CO two up here, and that's that supercritical CO two. You could cool it down and be in this region at room temperature. I think that probably still classifies as supercritical CO2 because it's above the critical pressure um, and the critical, yeah, it's above the critical pressure at room temperature. So um, you have to pressurize that liquid and get it up to that point. <clears throat> Here's helium, which has got a really strange, um, it does have a negative slope to its uh, solid. No, actually this isn't solid. This is uh, the superfluid that I was talking about. So helium one, helium two. So it has a liquid liquid transition. It's just so strange. They're both liquids. How can they have a phase transition? 
And so the only way to detect that really is this the superfluid property where, where the um, helium-2 superfluid has no surface tension. So if it were to wet the container that it's in and you had it in a con closed container, the meniscus would be in the middle. <laughs> Wouldn't that be trippy? Is it? It doesn't. If it contain, if it likes the container, and there's no penalty for having a having a, men, a meniscus, um, it would just like wet the surface all around. Now gravity would play a role, but if you had it in in the space station, you would have a meniscus in the middle. So that's really strange. Whereas yeah, over here, huh? Yeah. yeah, it would just leave. Yeah, it would wet the beaker and go out the outside. Yeah. But this is a good phase diagram to show um, because here it actually shows you the two solid phases. So this is body center cubic and hex, hexagonal close pack or face center cubic, FCC. So I don't know if you know how to, let me, let me do my best to draw these. Um, so I'm drawing a cube. Okay, and so if you have a, 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 a helium atom in every corner of that cube, okay, and then one in the middle, that's body center cubic, B, C, C. Now look how that was put together. I've got four atoms here and a ball resting on top of those four atoms. Okay, well, I mean, that, that's also next to one that's resting on four atoms here, 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 and, and in the back. And so they, they also for, form four atoms resting on four balls. And then this ball is resting in the center of those four atoms. So it's, it's groups, it's sort of four atoms as a base um, with an atom in the middle. Now I could make a, 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 a tighter packing by letting this go from squares to rhombuses and make hexagonal patterns. And that's what face center cubic is. So let me draw another cube. This is, uh, do y'all cover this in inorganic? Are y'all in inorganic yet? Advanced yeah. inorganic? Okay. Okay, so then. So we have our, our four corners have helium atoms on them. You can draw your four, your eight helium atoms. And then face center cubic has a helium atom in every face. There's one in the back. And there's one in the front, which is really close to that one, and the one on the side, and one on the bottom. And notice how these these atoms all kind of show up in a diagonal line here. Do you see that? Okay. Now look at these three atoms in the face. I'm just going to draw those three facial atoms right here. There's one there, or one in the back, and one here, and that forms a triangle. And then that corner atom is sitting on top of that triangle. So it makes these little tetrahedrons. And so this, you know, this, if I drew those layers, it would be kind of like layers that go vertical. This one, the layers go diagonal and they're hexagonal close pack, HCP. So there's three atoms with an atom on top as opposed to four atoms with an atom on top. And the three atoms without an atom on top are closer together. And so they are a tighter packing, which makes sense because that's a higher pressure. So the body center cubic for helium lasts only for us this small region, and then it snaps into the hexagonal close pack. But there you can see the two phases of the helium and how one's a more densely packed than the other. Um, but that's what's going on with the solid-solid phase transitions. For the liquid-liquid phase transitions, seems bizarre to me, but apparently that you could detect that with surface tension or not. So there's something different about the liquids. I don't know how they determine that they're two different phases. So that's a mystery to me. If you don't understand that, join join the club. Yeah. So now let's put these together. So we have that PT phase diagram over there on the left. So we're looking at it from you know the P and the T axis, and then we have the PV phase diagram over here on the right. And these are combined in this 3D shape. Yeah, don't draw. <laughs> yeah, I'm not drawing that. He says. And so then I found this online, and this is what we I passed these around. I think we talked about them in lab. And then I got a new 3D printer. And so let me show up on the camera here. This is the MakerBot from about six years ago, and this is the new Ultimaker S5, very much nicer. 
a smoother print. Um, but yeah. So you can pass these around. So you can look at it in this direction and see pressure and temperature on the x-axis. And you see the, the solid gas line here and the solid liquid line there in the critical point. You see that? Then you turn it this way and you see the PV phase back. And so that's that's what's going on. That's why it's difficult. And and for years, even my undergraduate year, we never saw the three D surface. I never understood how these two diagrams related to each other. So when I saw this figure in the textbook, like getting ready for PCAM and evaluating the textbooks, I'm flipping through the pages and I saw that that three D diagram. I was like. No way, <laughs> you know, because they put them all together, put the PT and the PV diagrams together, and I could see, oh, this is a 3D shape. And that, that just really helped me synthesize all of the equilibria and everything and what's going on, and the different changes in volumes, that, that a gas is a bigger volume than a liquid and a bigger volume than a solid. So, yeah. So... Um, we'll come back and do that top hat, but then way up here in the in the upper regions where it's just gas, we have the Carnot cycle. <laughs> Don't you dare look that way. She's just like oh. <laughs> flashbacks. Yeah. So so here it is up here on the right where you have all gas, right? And that's your working fluid. You have the isotherms, which are particular points on the temperature axis. Okay. And so you have these, these, these particular points on the temperature axis are your isotherms. And then when it rolls straight downhill or kind of straight downhill, those are the adiabats. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you look at that diagram, the adiabats are the steeper curves. They go, they go downhill, not, not, not following a temperature line. They're going down the hill. And I've drawn it on the orange one. I don't know how to draw on the black one. I have to get one of those paint pens where it's a lighter color painting on the black. Yeah, and so, but I just thought that was great to not only show the, how the PT and the PV phase diagrams fit to each other, but to show where the Carnot cycle is on that thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and we still just use gases for our engines. We, we still use gases to push pistons and everything because they can be so easily pumped from A to B. They expand the most when you heat them up, so you get a lot more force and so on. So let's uh, let's do the top hat. So I've got, this is a long one, so there's like six questions, so please answer as quickly as possible. Yeah, because I, I want to ask you lots of questions about the phase diagrams. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so let's look at the PT phase diagram. What letter is in the region that is the gaseous, the gaseous region? So these are exactly the same kind of questions I ask on the homework and on the tests. Like you need to be able to read the phase diagrams and know what's going on in each different places. All right, good deal. Okay, thank you, 100%. Y'all are awesome. Yeah, man. <laughs> Take a breather, yeah. Okay, what letter is associated with the melting point in this phase diagram? The melting point. Pay attention to the lines. <laughs> Okay, good. That's good. Okay, different answers here. It's F. Let's go up to the picture. Can you see the picture? Let's see. Okay, yeah. See, E is the triple point. So it's a particular spot on the phase diagram, but the melting point, the normal melting point, you follow the one atmosphere line across and you pick the, the, um, temperature at which it crosses. Okay, which letter is associated with the triple point? I kind of predicted that people would. Know. 
Yeah. All right. Okay, come on. Yay. All right, good deal. All right, now let's go to the PV phase diagram to review some of those. Oh, no, wait, wait. What is this? Oh, yeah, okay. I said PT up there, but it's really PV. Okay. Which letters in the solid region? I really wish I, you know, they had those point at and touch questions, but there's no way to put a right answer in on those. So, so I have to just do the letters. All right, good deal. All right, so A um, is the right answer. Scroll up. See over here, and so if I if I had forgotten, let's say, oh dang, I can't remember this crazy diagram. Think about this: high pressure, low volume. So you're squeezing it into a smallest space. The most dense substance, and most substances are is the solid. Okay. And then the boiling region. Now, in the PV phase diagram, the it's not a boiling point, it's a boiling region. Because there's a region where there's equilibrium between liquid and gas, so that's the boiling region. Oh, almost. Okay. So E is the boiling region. If you couldn't remember between E and F or G, over here, at high volume, moderate pressure, but the high volume is the key, that's gas. And so the boiling has to incorporate gas. And so it's either E or G. Okay. And then you know that A is solid because it's the lowest volume. And so G has to be gas solid. And so E has to be between the gas and liquid. So that's that's how you would piece it together. I'm just kind of walking you through the thinking if this is something that's still st stumping you. Okay, and then the sublimation region. What region indicates the sublimation? And obviously I copied all these questions, so I have that copy-paste error up there. It says PT phase diagram, but it's a PV. <laughs> So I'm hoping that you start to like phase diagrams because once you know how to read them, then the questions are very straightforward. Um, okay, G, very good. So that's the region down there at the bottom. The gas is on the gas is on that side, the solids on that side, and that's the region of sublimation. All right, so then there's a lot of supplemental stuff in this lecture that is, is valuable stuff, but just it's just not, I don't know, it's, it's not, it doesn't rise to the level of absolutely have to cover, okay? So, so go through it. Um, we get into uh, supercritical fluids. Basically, it's just that region above the, the critical point. And then we get into Gibbs energy. The only thing I would say, look at this. This is how Gibbs energy relates to uh, the various phase diagrams. It's like I said, this is supplemental material, but it's it's nice to nice to know. And then we get into surface tension. Uh, we will have a lab associated with the surface tension stuff. But go ahead and look through those notes just to become familiar with surface tension of different substances. And then when we get to that lab in a couple of weeks, maybe four weeks, um, you know. It'll, it'll all come back to you, all right? So, y'all have a great day. Yes.